Uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Polly Carl and let her take us through uh, what it is that we're going to do. So, perfect, everybody on time and off we go. Polly, take it away. Um, so, uh, the, um, so welcome. It's so exciting. And it's not sunny, which I'm really glad about, otherwise it's going to be glaring in here. Uh, so, um, the first, I just really want to start off with um, welcome. Welcome on behalf of Maria, on behalf of the New Play Institute. Uh, this is um, <coughs> David convening number what that we've had out of the Institute? Five? Five. Five or six? Six. Six? six? Okay. It's so convening number six. We periodically get together and talk about sort of key issues in the field with various groups of people. We try to spread the love and invite new people every time. Uh, we generally get a certain level of harassment about why people are not invited and why people are invited. Uh, we can have that conversation later, but uh, you're all here because um, you probably not, don't have to. Uh, and, uh, you're uh, all here because uh, you know this is a, a, a field that you've thought about, been in, talked about, the literary office, uh, and so um, you're here because we bring experts. Um, and, and some new ideas. So uh, and there are fresh faces, and old faces, and that kind of thing. So the, uh, what I thought we'd start with is just um, a quick introduction. Uh, the arena staff are here to help you uh, as much as we possibly can. We're wearing a very stylish uh, name tag in silver. Uh, and um, so those people are around. The, um, uh, and maybe if they would just introduce themselves first, and then everybody else will just have you all go around and do a quick introduction. So Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Becerra, I'm one of the New Play Producing Fellows. Hi, I'm Jason King-Jones, I'm a New Play Producing Intern. Hi, I'm Jamie Glenn, I'm the Associate Director of the Institute. <laughs> uh, I'm Dan Charnock, I'm the Artistic Associate and Casting Director. Good morning, my name is Erin Washington, I'm a New Play Producing Fellow. Hi, I'm Aaron Malkin, and I'm the Senior Literary Fellow. Vijay Matthew, Associate Director of the Institute. Hi, I'm Laura Raines. I'm the Artistic Development Intern. Is that everyone at the staff level that's helpful? Oh, no, they're Amritha. Yes, Hi, I'm Amritha. I'm the Literary Manager. But she mostly gets to not help this week and be part of the conversation. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> unless, we, unless we change our minds. Um, and so, um, uh, if, then if you all, you know, you're all going to have lots of conversation, but it'd just be great if we know who all is in the room. So if you could just do the quick your name and where you're from. Karen Zacharias, um, resident playwright, Arena Stage. Uh, Amy Freed, uh, resident playwright, visiting to San Francisco, Arena Stage. Otis Ramsey Zoe, uh, classical theater model, uh, but based out of DC, teaching at Howard University. Tanya Palmer, Goodman Theater. Adrian Alves Hansel, Studio Theater. Lauren Henderson, playwright, and Kim Uh Janice Parents, Sundance Theater Program. Heather McDonald, playwright, Day 7 DC. Molly Smith, artistic director, Arena Sage. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you all here. Liz Engelman, I'm on the 48th parallel. Roger Shapiro on Whidbey Island and Top Lake Center up in the Boundary Waters. Uh, Danielle Major Zamato, I'm at the Old Globe Theater, and I'm the president of LMDA. Uh, Shirley Sorowski, and I'm with Theater J. Uh, Jessica Burgess with the Inkwell here in Lily Skin with the Inkwell Guarantee DC. John Roar, South Coast Rep. Jerry Patch, Manhattan Theatre Club. Madeline Oldham, Berkeley Rep. Joy Mead, Center Theatre Group in LA. Raphael Martin, Soho Rep. Jojo Roof, the National New Play Network. Uh, Pat Flick, Orlando Shakespeare, National New Play Network. Nan Barnett, at Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm former uh, president of NNPN and former managing director of Florida Stage. Emily Morse, New Dramatist. Uh, Julie Dubner, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and board member of LMDA. Marilyn Millstone, I'm a local playwright. Lauren Howerson, Studio Theater. Martin Cutlin, Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. Liz Frankel, the Public Theater. Aaron Carter, Stead Wolf. Eric Ramsey, Ohio University MFA Playwriting Program, and Wordbridge. Janine Sobek, VP of Communications for LMDA. Amy Ossie Delgado, the Nathan Institute Theater Program. Charles Hoagland, Huntington Theater Company. Uh, Matt DeGardner, Signature Theater. Ilana Brownstein, uh, Playwrights Commons and Company One Theater and Boston University. <laughs> <laughs> Christian Parker, Atlantic Theater Company. I think, I think that's everyone, yeah, everyone got in. Uh, and then just so you know, Janice Perrin is here. I asked Janice if she uh, would uh, be the scribe of this event. Uh, we every, after, every time we do a 
one of these convenings, we do uh, what we call a white paper, uh, just to do our best at capturing the spirit of the conversation that happened. Uh, and so uh, Janice has been tasked with writing that. So she will mostly be observing uh, versus, you know, in the thick. But if, if you feel this kind of urge that you have, we can allow you to say a thing or two. But in general, uh, no, in general, she'll be, uh, she'll be. So that's exactly right, Ronnie. Yeah, I'm outing you. Yeah, so people know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't have your picture taken with Janice. Um, so, uh, uh, so all of you have received a folder. Contains that you have your name tag, your agenda, your part of the participant list, um, logistical info, all that logistical stuff. That for those of you who already lost your folder, like I, <laughs> <laughs> for all the logistical stuff, uh, <laughs> no, Jamie's laughing because she knows I've already lost it. Um, is, um, Kevin uh, and um, Jamie will, can help you with that sort of thing. Um, in your folder, you're also going to find a media release form. Uh, this allows us to capture you on video and photo. Um, reminder: we are live streaming this. Uh, and um, hence the makeup. No, I <laughs> um, we're live streaming the full convening. Um, the only thing we're not uh, streaming are the breakouts. Uh, and then also, um, it's on New Play TV, and then we're doing, doing some tweeting out uh, at, at um, hashtag New Play on Twitter. So um, that, uh, and then in terms of, uh, I guess, other media stuff, Aaron Malkin is here, and Aaron is going to be doing the kind of summary blog post at the end of the day, just to, again, uh, the goal of this, and, and just so that you understand, you know, in, in many ways you're really delegates, so as much as you may want to consider yourself the chosen, uh, you are really just delegates uh, to the larger community, and so I hope that you'll take that job very seriously. So for whatever ways you participate in your community, whether you do it via Twitter or Facebook or, um, I don't know, your own personal blogs or just, uh, you know, you actually do live communication. Uh, <laughs> I um, would be, uh, in, in, we'd be very indebted for you to take responsibility to try to do what you can over both the course of these two days and moving forward to make sure people feel like they've been asked to participate, given that we only have the funds to bring you know, this group of 40 here um, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, you really are, um, it's, it's a very important sort of responsibility to invite that third circle in and say, you know, you can also be a uh, joining the conversation. And you, it's, it's amazing in, in the, the time that I've been you know, around these convenings, how many people actually participate in that way, either at the, during the kind of the heart of it or um, uh, after the fact, if you're watching the live stream later on. So we get a lot of people just, you know, come in later when they can. So, uh, um, and then I, my goal is to go over the basic schedule for Friday, except that I don't have my folder. So next up, uh, David is going to be having an interview with uh, Jerry Patch. The following, uh, Jamie, do you want to just say the schedule because you have it in front of you? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, from two to three, David's going to be interviewing Jerry, and then from three fifteen to four thirty, we're going to hear manifestos from some uh, folks in the room about the literary office, the twenty first century literary office, and then following that, there'll be a breakout session where everyone will get a chance to distill and talk about uh, what you've heard from the afternoon. And then after that, we go to dinner and shows. For those of you seeing shows here at Arena, um, if you have reserved a ticket there, you can just pick it up at Will Call. It's under your name. And um, nightcaps afterwards at the bar if you are still standing. Uh, <laughs> and if you have any other questions, just let us know. And then uh, breakout groups are detailed on the back of your name tag. So uh, when it's time for a breakout, group leaders will raise um, their binders. This is binder. And um, uh, they'll, they'll have their group letter on it. So group is. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Any, uh, anybody have any logistics questions? Questions, anything you need to know? Uh, okay, great. Jamie's giving me the thumbs up that I covered all the things. <laughs> Um, okay, so the, um, the the thing that so what I've been tasked to do this this, this afternoon is just very briefly and really briefly because I'm not um, uh, you know uh, going to be able to cover all of the details of this. But I want to talk about the context of why this convening. Why we, so if we can do two or three convenings a year, why do one on the literary office of the 21st century? So I'm going to try to contextualize that briefly. I'm going to try to just make sure we remember. Um, you know, the history of where the literary office comes from. So again, most of you probably know all this better than I do, so, you know, feel free to kind of break in and correct me or something, but just to give us a little bit of that history. And then um, the last thing I want to do in this 45-minute stretch is uh, talk about just the idea of a convening and how, um, I don't know, how we should all try to behave. Um, so, um, and I, I mean that in the best sense. So, uh, and I'm going to track my, I'm keep watching my time here, so I'm not actually texting, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, so the, uh, the, this particular um, convening comes out of the swirl that really was 
there were a couple of things that happened for those of you who were born prior to 2007. Um, <laughs> there were a couple of things that, you know, not that many people now, but um, the, the, a couple of things that happened, uh, you know, 2007, uh, Richard Nelson writes this piece, which if you did anything related to dramaturgy in 2007, you took utterly personally. Um, <laughs> uh, if you were running a Playwright Center as I was, uh, you felt completely offended uh, by this piece, and, uh, and it, I think it created a big stir in our community, so I want to just remind us of that for a brief moment. Um, the, the thing that uh, Richard said was, um, uh, playwrights are in need of help. This is now almost a maxim in our theaters today. Unquestioned, a given. But where does this mindset, for that is what it is a mindset, come from? Of course, playwrights need things. Money, production, support, encouragement. So do actors, designers, artistic directors. But this mindset is different because what is meant here is playwrights are in need of help uh, to write their plays. They are in need of help to do their work. They can't do their work themselves. Now a culture of help breeds a culture of dependence, and this is what I believe we now have in the American theater, the culture of readings and workshops, a culture of development. And again, that's a culture that most of us in this room are part of creating, and so we uh, took this piece to heart, and uh, um, I, I know the conversations I was in, there was a lot of conversation that emerged from it. Shortly thereafter, so in 2008, um, uh, uh, Outrageous Fortune uh, comes out, uh, and in Outrageous Fortune, although I think it, it, all of us would say had, had enormous value and contribution to the field. Again, there was a weird thing that happened around literary offices and dramaturgs in terms of what the kind of how that was articulated. So I like to call it uh, credit for nothing and blamed for everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> A mantra that I often use when I'm working dramaturgically. I go, oh God, I didn't get any credit, but I sure do get blamed for what goes wrong. So um, the, in the world of credit for nothing and blame for everything, uh, there was a conversation about literary offices in uh, that, um, uh, in Outrageous Fortune. And again, I'm just gonna do, a lot of this is quoting today so that you know I'm not making it up, it really happened. Uh, for, for most theaters, it is the literary manager who mans the gate, or woman's it, uh, uh, through which the most plays pass. Literary managers are, as one agent calls them, the book club, keeping eyes out for talent and possibility. Playwrights speak of literary managers with sympathy and sometimes affection. Many feel they have supporters in literary offices, people who read a lot and care about writers. Writers know what these literary managers speak to, uh, know that these literary managers speak to each other and recommend plays. Ultimately, however, most playwrights believe that literary managers have at most the power and responsibility to say no to a play but they lack the power to say yes. And I think that, um, oh, and then the last line here, literary offices serve theaters, not playwrights. And it, it seems to me that, um, you know, in the world of literary offices and, and dramaturgs as kind of um, uh, background people, uh, the, the, there's been less opportunity. So a book like this comes out and it actually in an odd way becomes a conversation between playwrights and artistic directors, um, but it becomes about literary offices and dramaturgs. And so what, what between sort of Richard Nelson and this, you know, as we were starting to do these convenings, and again, we've been planning, you know, the sort of string of convenings for a while, it seemed like it was central to bring together the group of people that gets, keeps getting talked about, but less often talked to. Uh, and so I just, again, contextualizing, this is why we're all sitting in this room today, is sort of how do we talk about ourselves, how do we think about ourselves, and how do we, um, you know, find a way in that uh, uh, to um, sort of get that message out, because the message of the artistic director and the playwright's been one that's been told now pretty consistently. So, um, the, and then I just want to note that the swirl that is, you know, 2007 and 2008, for those of you born before 1988, um, that you might know, uh, Douglas Anderson wrote a piece, um, The Dream Machine, 30 Years of New Play Development in America, which is one that, I, I read that piece all the time because it's completely relevant, and it's like 25 years old, and it's like, or I don't know, and it's, uh, um, and it's, it's nothing's changed, everything's the same. Um, so it's good to remember that we just are repeating history fairly consistently. And uh, he, he starts off that piece, uh, you know, in 1987, I think it was, or 86, uh, Terrence McNally wrote, um, uh, you know, that piece in the New York Times, I think a dramaturg can do more harm than good. Uh, and uh, Douglas Anderson says, his article, a short, straightforward piece in the New York Times, seemed particularly daring in view of the influence literary staffs now wield in our nation's theaters. A playwright hungry for regional productions might think twice before going public with the following. I have seen so many plays so rewritten and improved at the behest of a well-intentioned dramaturg that the actual life force that caused them is stifled. One shudders to think what hoops a structurally-minded dramaturg would have wanted O'Neill to jump through. 
Um, so, you know, these are the things that we're all contending with, and we're not going to spend the whole weekend, um, you know, weeping over them. But uh, we are. Uh, but I want us to sort of know that you know, the, there's a conversation that we have not. Uh, uh, we, we have not moved past, right? So we did it in '86. We did it sometime in the '70s and in the '90s, and you know, and now you know, with outrageous fortune and, and Richard Nelson in, in, in the 21st century. Um, the a couple of things I think are important to note about that uh, that these that these questions come out of assumptions of what are at the core of the formation of the literary office. So. The idea of the literary office is a relatively new phenomenon, and even dramaturgy in the U.S., I'm not talking about dramaturgy in Germany now, but dramaturgy in the U.S., relatively new phenomenon, and so, again, you know, I want to spend, like, you know, two minutes contextualizing that. Um, uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and I feel like it's important in part because, you know, one of the things I'm feeling in the, you know, I spend a lot of time in the blog world, the social media world, which I think is terrific, but one of the things that's happening in that world is uh, because anybody can um, say whatever they want and just publish it themselves. It used to be if you were going to publish something, somebody else had to read it and confer that it had an ounce of credibility to it. Um, but now that doesn't actually have to happen. And so I feel like this, it, it, this question of context and remembering the historical part is a huge responsibility as we have this conversation today. Because otherwise it becomes like we're just sort of... Um, uh, you, you know, we, we don't want to fall into that kind of bog world of oh, we just this is, this is what we think today, so that means it must be new and fresh and meaningful. Um, and so, uh, so you know, I, I, so I kind of went back to you know, Art Brecka's got that great piece about dramaturgy. We play dramaturgy. It's most of you probably read at Yale and the Iowa Ideals, but it, it's such a great reminder of kind of like you know, if you look at sort of Yale School of Dramaturgy and where we really start talking about the dramaturg in the room that, that kind of comes out of that sort of 60s and 70s motion and. Many of you know it better than I do, but again, my job is just to put it on the table today. Uh, in, in 77, uh, you know, 1977, Bob Brustein and Yale reworked the literature and criticism program into an MFA, DFA, and dramaturgy and dramatic criticism. And again, I'm just going to remind us of what the goals of that were. The new program had, in Robert Brustein's words, the explicitly objective, turn, objective to turn alienated critics into helpful and creative associates. The word, you see where Richard got his word helpful, creative <laughs> associates, um, imbued with the philosophy that the theater must participate in the intellectual life of his age, and that the intellectual aspect of the theater, too often scorned by American theater professionals, must be ever present and sound. The goals of the program are to resolve the antipathy between the intellectual and the practical, and to fuse the two into an organic whole. And I think it's important to note here that what Bereka uh, Art reminds us in this piece is that the idea was that to take something that was external criticism, so to take the idea of the critic who's a person who's telling an audience, here's what you should think or you know, not think of this play, and to take that and bring it to the internal workings of the process. So now we've charged these same people who are interested in external criticism to be internal critics of the play and the process. This is an editorial comment on my end, but that feels like a terrible setup. Um, for people who are asked to do dramaturgy in a room. Uh, we're going to hire an internal critic. Uh, and so I hope you feel safe now making your play. <laughs> uh, so I think, but I think it's a really important piece to note about, you know, kind of this notion of where dramaturgy <coughs> comes from. It comes out of that notion of criticism. And it comes also out of um, this idea of intellectual rigor. Uh, and, you know, that's another strange position to be in uh, dramaturgically, and again, this is my editorial comment, which is a strange position to say you're going to be the person who brings intellectual rigor to the play, right? I mean, that, that could be offensive, potentially, uh, to somebody who is a playwright who thinks maybe they're doing that on their own. Um, so I feel like there are some things that are rooted in kind of the history of, of, of how dramaturgy became part of what we do in the theater that um, I, might be interesting to contend with over the course of this couple of days. Um, uh, then there are um, some more assumptions uh, rooted in that 77 document about um, what the dramaturg does. Uh, uh, it's the 77 Dramaturg's Guide, a handbook for the student dramaturgs at the Yale School of Drama. This is um, one of the phrases from there, which I, um, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, you and your critical skill are there as a resource, ready in case the director feels he needs your opinion. Anything is possible. He may need you, call upon you and use your advice to stunning effect. He may call upon you and ignore you. He may need you and not know it. Or he may simply not need you. Whether, 
Whether he will call on you or not depends largely on his personality and work method. Yours, the relationship you have established, in short, chemistry. He will let you know if he wants to hear from you. Um, <laughs> when I, if I had read that, I would never have dramaturged anything in my home. Unfortunately, I wasn't trained to dramaturg, so that worked out well. I didn't know that was there. Um, so, um, but I think, again, I, again, I, I really am, you know, I just wanted to put in, like, here are some of the things at the kind of core of the formation of a field, which are rooted in this idea of, you know, you know, you'll be called, you know, don't only speak if you're spoken to. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, Given, because I know many of you in this room, the level of intelligence and sort of commitment to theater and experience in the room, that's a weird position to be in. Uh, it's not one I do very well, uh, personally. And so I think it's interesting to note the, just the relationship, the history of the relationship of the dramaturg to process. So I, I, again, I put it out there. It does have, you know, it does have my editorial chuckles in there, but it, it's, uh, um, I put it out there. And then finally, this is the last piece I want to contextualize for um, just the history part. Uh, and this comes from D the Douglas Anderson piece. Um, and, he, and here he's talking specifically, he does this, uh, he goes on this little journey around the country, you know, and he visits every new play development center and talks to everyone. And he, he says this um, uh, implicitly, he, he's talking about O'Neill here now and his visit to O'Neill, but he's, he's also, you know, I think talking about play development more generally. Implicit in the O'Neill system are several debatable ideas. A, that massive input is helpful, perhaps necessary to the development of new work. B, that massive, on-the-spot rewriting improves the text. C, that directors can be randomly assigned to text and respond to them with creativity and insight. And D, that a public debate with audiences and a wide array of conference members is valuable. And again, I put that out there because, you know, when I, when I was rereading that, I thought, yeah, it's a really interesting set of assumptions, right? I mean, and it, but if you've run a play development center as I have, it's exactly the assumptions that you are uh, taking for granted, the idea that there is value in randomly assigning director on occasion. Ideally, it's better if they know the director, but we randomly assign on a regular basis. Um, we, uh, we, ought, we actually believe rewriting makes the play better. We think it's better, although I bet every one of you have seen, would, would tell the story of the play that got rewritten that got worse. But, but the idea is that it will get better. Um, and so, uh, um, and that, you know, audience involvement in that process could somehow be valuable. So, um, what I want us to just, you know, have in, um, have in mind this, this, this next couple of days is just, you know, where we started from, which isn't that long ago, A, and B, what are some of the assumptions of what we started on? So I put that out there. I think we'll come back to it in lots of different ways, but I just wanted, you know, to sort of say here are the things that were driving us as we were thinking about this conversation. Um, and then, um, so now just a couple other things I want to do. The, the next is um, you all, uh, Many of you, most of you, I, we asked if you would talk about what your hopes were to get out of this couple days. So um, I want to uh, just quote from you uh, what you said that you would sort of ask for, um, and uh, and then maybe give you a second to add if I missed anything. Uh, and then I have one last section, and then um, th thank God I will be off live stream. Um, the, uh, so what you said you'd hope to take away from this weekend, um, and this is, I'm focusing now, I, we asked professional and personal, I'm mostly focusing on your professional hopes. Uh, many of you said, and I, I've taken, uh, I, I, I won't be quoting all of you, but I've taken sort of what were the consistent themes. So the consistent themes. How can we use new technology to make our work faster, greener, more efficient? And I certainly would be interested in getting some practical information about how other lit managers and literary officers have incorporated new technology to help them in their process. Uh, and I'd be interested to talk to playwrights about ways that we could take advantage of new technology to communicate with them in more effective and efficient and cost-effective manner. Another uh, idea, I want to discuss what are signs of promise in an early career. Another idea, I'd like to discuss where the influence of the literary department manager lies in relation to our ability to influence the decision makers, artistic directors, in our theaters toward development and production of writers. We. Uh, we feel need, uh, um, who feel we need, who, uh, of writers we feel need a voice in troubled times when safe decisions are the norm. Uh, on the one hand, and then this another idea, on the one hand I work on projects that come to me with legs and then go off to have a life. On the other hand, I encounter worthy works with writers who like Hester and Susan Laurie Parks in the Blood can't get a leg up. What can we do? 
Um, I've been thinking a lot about the way we introduce or don't new plays to artistic directors in, and producers. Is there a need for a new, different, enhanced format for communicating information about pieces available for development and production? Next one, I would like to see how we could talk about new plays in terms of relationships and connections with writers, what opportunities and environments we are creating to better know their voices and their work, rather than talking about plays as commodities, as play shopping. In other words, process over products. How to be facilitators and stewards of relationships. Then I'm interested in an aggressive and honest conversation about unsolicited script policies at large theaters and how they are evolving and changing, how much replication currently goes on with literary offices around the country and how might this be combated. I want to engage in an actual, productive, practical conversation about how institutional theaters and smaller upstart theaters that are yet modeled on institutional uh, hierarchies can productively support different models of the creative generative process. How artists can both lead the conversation about process and also how literary play development offices can help emerging artists try new forms. Uh, I'd like to discuss the value of extra dramaturgical materials when reading a new play, including research, visuals, dramaturgy websites, in each new play to provide context, images, synopses. Does the writing speak for itself or do these elements help understand the play better? Uh, and then um, this person asking the question, is there more we can do to free up our imaginative brain space as well as limited hours in our lives to do the big picture work rather than reject the next playwright in line work, which kills my soul, by the way. <laughs> um, a subject that interests me and is increasingly a topic of painful conversation among friends who are writers, actors, directors is the issue of sustainability of our souls, really. Uh, once you have emerged and have had a crack at some regional productions and won a few of the wonderful fellowships and grants, you hit this vast desert that has few points of navigation. Uh, and just when you have some craft, a wee bit of wisdom, humor, and grace, you are also likely faced with an array of life demands that be, mean you need some sort of grown-up income that's re re steady and reliable. It seems there's a big gap in our field between the emerged world and the elder statesman woman, and you make that journey. So that's from you all. Uh, Anything that you're not thinking about based on, I'm just going to take a breath, because that was long, uh, kind of long intro. I have one more little section, but I wanted to stop for a second. Okay. So um, to uh, say, is there anything I missed of yours that you hope will come? Nothing. Good, all right, we can keep going. I'd love someone else to speak besides me. <laughs> um, but <if> not, <laughs> Yes, Christian, thank you. No, I, Help I, me. Because well, I failed to complete this. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> so now I'm, now I'm thinking my answer. But uh, no, I, I think um, I'm interested in, in uh, the ways in which uh, actually artistic staffs or literary staffs, uh, other than the artistic director, um, can reassert themselves as um, uh, sort of stewards or keepers of the mission, actually, of the theater. Um, and therefore, hopefully, have an impact on their own. Influence. Yeah, related to that, mm -hmm. I, I also failed to do that. Um, but, but I was sitting here thinking it would be wonderful to include some conversation about institutional dramaturgy. Great. And the notion that, um, you know, I, I love the quote you read from Bob Burstein, and another one of my favorite things that he said was that dramaturgs are the, the intellectual conscience of the theater itself. Mm -hmm. um, and play a role, not necessarily the most important in the room, but in the office of your artistic director and the staff. Um, I think these things are embedded in what's going to happen, but that's, that's great. Yes, David. Uh, there are three people who will be coming for the introduction part, sitting right there on the end. We should oh, get them into it. Thanks, David. I appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so uh, the three of you who, yes, yeah, so you introduce, introduce yourself. Just, just just your name and your affiliation. And uh, I'm Miriam Weisfeld with uh, Woolly Mammoth Theater. I'm John Baker with Woolly Mammoth as well. I'm Rachel Chapkin. I'm the artistic director of the team. Thank you, guys. Sorry, I missed you. <laughs> Miriam didn't do her homework because you're doing that big cyber narrative thing. So we can we're a little bit yeah, a little bit together. Uh, other other things that we want to make sure we cover. Yes. Um, I wonder uh, whether it's worth talking at some point about the education of playwrights in terms of the um, particularly MFA programs, but how 
Uh, I guess the editing process is taught or not taught in a component or value even of, of that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That reminds me. Um, some players that don't have an FAs are curious about how to convey the training that they that they do themselves, either by taking classes at institutions like Player Center or Player mm -hmm. Foundation or these various things, and how to convey, how to convey that um, without the, the letters behind the name. Mm -hmm. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah, it's great. Like, how does how does one how does one emerge out of the pile? Right. Yeah. So, yeah I have some yeah. training. I just don't have mm -hmm. the math. Yeah, sure, please. No, no, please. But this is actually, this is also about training, but uh, this is sort of selfishly motivated since I run a training program, but training for dramaturgs mm -hmm. and, and how, we, how can we redefine that to help us redefine the profession? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, great, that's great, yeah. Yeah, that's Could I have a hand? Oh, uh, Joy, thanks, sorry, I can't. Um, I'd like to also think about like the dramaturg's place in the system of the, the of the theatrical community. So how playwrights can be instrumental in really um, listening to the play, making sure not to be committing dramaturgical malpractice, but listening to the play, finding its pulse, and keeping another finger on the pulse of the audience, and trying to find points of connection and way, ways into the, um, the plays for those audience members who want to dig deeper, who want to feel like they're part of a, a community of um, intellectually minded, lifelong warmth, um, learners um, who explore imaginatively in these worlds, and um, and also to really help play, uh, to help audiences find ways into work that might not meet their expectations about what a play is. And I think there's something implicit in kind of this. this I mean, it's sort of what I was saying, and, you know. But it's that sort of. Um, it feels to me always like the tension, and I know we've talked about this a lot in preparation, so I know we're going to cover it in these next two days, uh, which is that tension between this kind of external and internal role. So, you know, and, and, and just, you know, the question, I suppose, put, you know, not in the positive is, you know, is that, is that a reasonable expectation that one person can navigate inside and outside at the same time? Because it feels to me like when, and again, my experience, particularly as a dramaturg, but then also as the person kind of over, not really a literary manager, but kind of overseeing the literary department, that that is a lot to ask of a person, A, and I don't know if there are always um, uh, ex things that go together, you know, to sort of go, I'm going to try to make the play make sense to the audience, uh, and I'm going to try to make the sit play make sense to the people who are making it in the room at the moment they're making it. So I feel like that external, internal thing is something I, I hope we'll, really, you know, we'll get at, because I think that's what... Um, a lot of your comments are connected to. Yeah, Tanya. Yeah, and just building on that same idea, I mean, one thing that popped in my head while Joe was talking is the other external community that we're, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about and wringing our hands about are critics, too. Mm -hmm. And like, is there any, I mean, is, is there any relationship between the drama part of the literary staff and conversations with critics? Is there anything to be, you know, is, is that a conversation that can even happen? Yeah, can that merit say? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's such, because it's so interesting, of kind of the roots of dramaturgy and criticism and then how that, you know, uh, it, 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 I know this, is, this is true of, um, you know, a, a lot of times we'll hear when the critics are giving their reviews that they're actually dramaturging the play and the review, you know, so there, there's a way in which critics get into dramaturgy and uh, dramaturgs get into kind of the criticism element, so I, I think it's a really good question. Um, Liz, Just yeah. to throw out, um, I think what you guys are saying, a lot of these are really great topics. Just to say that, I mean, going to LMDA conference for the last however many years, a lot of this we talk about all the time and have been for you know for 25 years plus so what a goal for for me in this is to make sure that the conversation goes back to what you're saying in terms of the the what you started with which is their playwrights and institutions and often we're caught in the middle and people speaking for us but what do we want to talk about in that relationship because a lot of the internal stuff about these feelings about that we have as job terms I feel like we do that a lot at conferences anyway amongst yep. ourselves so I just want to go back to I mean my goal just to get back to the people speaking for us, but let's talk about what's being talked about right now. Yeah, that's right. And just so that, again, I'll just contextualize a second more based on that comment. You know, from, from our perspective in, in the work we're doing with the Institute and trying to sort of really build a theater commons, it's about, um, for us, I think, uh, you know, just making sure that we understand the conversation and the research and adding to the contribution. So we, uh, we know, I mean, uh, not to, uh, there's no sense that those conversations haven't happened for 25 years at LMD. I think we are, I mean, I just so, you know, I think they're no, just, super, super important, but no, no, I, I hear you. I'm just saying, I, I just to say, I think it's, it, we're, you know, exactly to your point of, we're trying to figure out how we make space in the 
conversation of these convenings for the voice that gets talked about but doesn't do the talking. So that's, you know, because we've had a number of convenings where this voice has not been heard. So I just wanted to put it in that. In that kind of. um, other? These are great. I'm so appreciative of the additions, yeah. Um, well, the artistic things I think are also a concern. Um, I'm really interested in the fact that many of us who run uh, uh, literary departments and selection process have a kind of develop them ourselves um, by hook and crook and stealing and borrowing and figuring out how to do this on our own and with the education of dramaturgs of how to basically assemble best practices for a literary office and, and to actually train not only the artistic portion of the next generation but also to train us as good administrators um, because it's huge administrative talent that, that often I don't see being addressed um, when we start talking and mixing words of literary office versus dramaturg. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, Karen. I'd like to investigate a little bit the relationship between literary managers and agents versus playwrights. Uh, because I feel sometimes that I get left out of an equation where I think I could have a good conversation with the literary, but now, because of the, there's agency and all of that, I just think that's something in being talked about without talking to that seems very interesting. Any last thoughts? Yes, David, please. I should probably um, come out explicitly in terms of my own goals for what we talk about. Um, I, I'm really interested in making sure that as we move into the 21st century literary office, where um, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, which is the old thing. I don't know what the baby is. And as somebody who is part of trying to think what comes next, um, I want to be, we want to use this weekend and your expertise to help identify what the actual baby is before we go into this whole uh, sort of move of change for change sake. Uh, what are we, what's the thing to be preserved in there? And I have to say, uh, what that means to me is, uh, you just said it, the, the sort of the, the squishy, the easy way in which we move between literary management and dramaturgy as all one conversation, as if it means, if it's one word. I don't understand that as somebody who's come out of the world of practice and not out of the world of academia to get to where I am. And so for me, a lot of what I'm trying to understand is how come that's such an easy, um, you know, what, how do we just make that relationship so easily in a, in a the, linguistically so easy? So that's part of what I'm hoping we understand by the end. Uh, yeah. I wonder if, in, in light of what David just said, if we could have a show of hands to see how many people consider themselves dramaturgs. How many people consider themselves literary managers, and how many people consider them, themselves both? I'm so happy to have that. Do it. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> how many? Yeah, dramaturgs. Uh, literary managers, or something, and both. <laughs> so, oh, interesting. I would have thought there'd be more, more in the both uh, literary both thing. Um, and I'd be interested. Yeah, we'll have that. Kind of <laughs> um, uh, how, one, how one chooses, right? Uh, <laughs> what your artistic director say, what you would say. I'm sorry. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, so the, the next, just the last thing I want to do is just so we're going to get into the meat of it. Clearly, we're not going to have any trouble getting into the meat of it. That seems obvious by the comments and uh, questions. Uh, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the idea of the convening. So uh, we did a convening last January, um, which uh, I, had a, I thought was terrific, you know, and I... Um, uh, uh, felt smug about it. It was good, and um, and then uh, I went somewhere to visit uh, another theater, and you know, we were having a conversation with a bunch of playwrights, and a person who was at that convening was like, "Oh my God, the worst experience I've ever had in my life was attending that convening." And, you know, <laughs> I felt less smug uh, at that moment, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, so I want to. Um, there, there may be those of you who say that anyway. But I want to uh, try to avoid that as the, as the outcome for anyone here. So um, that would be my, my hope would be that no one would have that experience. The, I find uh, convenings to be um, incredibly uh, difficult. Any kind of conference convening, on a, and I'll just speak personally, I, um, I don't care for them very much. I don't like the kind of public schmoozing. Uh, I, I much rather would, I would like to write an article for HowlRound and send it to you, then you could, someone could read it here. Um, and I would watch remotely from New Play uh, TV. Um, uh, I also find that um, it takes me a while. Uh, often I have a really good time. It takes a while to get going. I feel um, everybody's angling to start with kind of what their role is or position or why they're here or trying. You know, there's a, um, I would say, a kind of self-consciousness that overtakes us. Uh, I call it the world of the eye. 
the eye of the personality that is like, you know, what about me, what about me, what about me, and will I be heard? And, you know, it just becomes kind of, you know, a kind of narcissism that conferences bring out in us. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I hope we'll, you know, think about this couple days and, and do my best to help, you know, to the degree that I need help overcoming it, others of you as well. And I was thinking about um, uh, the importance of convenings for me as much as I don't like them very much, like how formative they have been. Uh, and um, uh, David Dower and I have a, you know, a story in 2002, uh, we went to a convening and uh, we were, I, you know, I don't even know I was invited. I got this invite, you know, it works in ways in 2002 and it was like, I had just become the uh, uh, artistic director of Clarity Center and I, uh, you know, totally kind of hanging out and, uh, um, and David was there and this conversation started and both David and I looked at each other and we'd not met each other at that point and we were like, what the fuck are we? I'm on TV. What the hell are you? <laughs> um, and so, uh, and, and it was, and David, I don't know, you can speak of that. You always tell that story better than I do, but, but something magical came out of that horrible experience for both of us that wouldn't have happened. And in fact, one of the things, oh, go ahead. You're, I can feel you're about to speak, and it'll be more interesting than uh, what I'm saying. Oh. Yeah. This, this is a longer story. I, I won't make your that. <laughs> I can feel him uh, chopping in the midst of it. It's important, though, because. Uh, what you just said, I'm going to sit in that chair. Yeah. What, <laughs> now, one of the things that you just said is actually really important to what we're starting with, which is the sense, starting from that sense of alienation. Yeah. Because in, in that conference, anybody here at that conference, 2002 in Portland, it was a TCG-sponsored conference uh, called New Works, New Ways, funded by Mellon and Duke? Nobody. Oh, interesting. So we can say anything we want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a conference that was designed to pull people together from around the country who were working on new works in new ways. And I, at the time I was working at the Z-Space, you were at the Claret Center, and the Z-Space was largely a, a volunteer organization. At the time, uh, almost no paid staff. I had a little bit of money, just a little, enough money to get myself there. And what I thought I was doing when I got there was I was going to figure out for the artists at the Z-Space how it was that I could put them into the national conversation. It had been very much focused on San Francisco, and everybody was kind of stuck behind the, the you know, stuck by the peninsula of, of uh, the Bay Area, nobody was moving out into the world. And I, I say this all the time, I, I thought there wasn't, there wasn't infrastructure, there was like a super highway um, that you could get a career, like if you could just get it in a car and get on, at an on-ramp, then you'd have your career. And the reason that none of these people had careers, because I didn't know the directions to the on-ramp. So I was failing my job, and so I took all of our money and I went to this thing, and I mean, so what was it, like $400? And that was like a huge indulgence. Maybe it was a little more. I don't know. I was on the West Coast already. Um, so I went to this thing to try to find the on-ramp. And in this conversation, as you're describing it, my experience of it, and I've since talked to many people who had different experiences, also many people who were alienated at the outset, was that the room was full of people who were doing it exactly the same way. And there were a handful of people that I went there, because I saw the names on the list, there were a handful of people who were going to be there, like Polly, like Todd, uh, like at the time, uh, Kim Eisner and the uh, Skirball uh, folks down in, in L.A. Uh, there, there were a, a number of people who were going to be there, uh, and some presenters, who were doing things very differently. But the conversation for the first several hours was entirely dominated. By, and the moderator fed into this. She would go from, let's hear from a producer. And it would invariably be a Lord producer talking about the challenges of the work. Okay, playwright, respond to that. And a playwright would respond to that. And then she'd say, is it different for the presenters? Presenter, go. And then producer. Playwright, presenter, producer, playwright, presenter. All people who were the same people doing it the same way. And so I finally raised my hand. And I said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I came to, to hear there are other people in the room who won't, don't fall into this little rubric that you have. And I came to hear that. And she said, uh, what's your name? And I said, David Arsh. She goes, well, I can promise you, David, it's not personal. <laughs> and then she went on to the next producer. And I was humiliated. And I literally, and this is, this is a dead true story. I'm sitting right next to her. I, I, I sit down. Still, I don't think we've talked to each other. And she just kind of pokes me. She goes, I'm so glad you said something. <laughs> and I look over, and there's a little cloud of black smoke hanging over her head. And, but I got up. I, I actually left. I was on my way out of the field. This is no exaggeration. I got up. I was so embarrassed that I got up and I walked out into the lobby and I was trying to decide whether I should stay the night I already paid for the hotel or go to the airport and try to get my uh, flight switched and just go back. And I, I was literally standing there, you know, trying to figure out, we didn't have smartphones in those days, just trying to talk myself through what just happened. I just resigned from the American theater. How am I going to talk? <laughs> I got to tell my wife this was a waste of money because it was our money, not the z space money. Uh, and, and this woman came out and she poked me in the ribs. And, you know, when I say she's tiny, she 
forgive me, she, she is tiny, um, but she has had an extraordinary impact on the American theater, and her name is Olga Garay. Uh, you guys may know her on the West Coast. Olga's now the, uh, I think she's the director of the Cultural Affairs. Sorry, Olga, what's your title? Um, she is uh, <laughs> the director of the funding agency that is the Los Angeles Cities, the City of Los Angeles' cultural funding. Uh, prior to that, she was uh, head of the Duke Foundation, and she was one of the people who was sponsoring this. And she came out, she elbowed me in the ribs, and she said, I'm so glad you said what you said. And I said, uh, I'm glad that you're happy about it, but I'm actually leaving. I feel totally embarrassed, and I'm leaving. She said, hell you are. And she grabbed me back in, and she goes, I'm Olga Garay, and I funded this thing. And she <laughs> dragged me back in the room, and then she kept saying, all right, what do you think about it? Every time someone happened, well, what do you think? And at the time, she asked me, well, you know, you can't, you don't just get to be bitter, you actually have to be productive. And so what would you do? And I said, well, I get some time for the people who are doing them in different ways. Okay, fine, here's time. She sort of drew a circle in the agenda of when we were going to talk. Then what else <laughs> would you do? Well, I'd ask, I want to talk to them about how we could, share. okay, fine, here's dinner. You, you make a table, and if anybody shows up at your table, you'll, you'll know there are other people. And at the time, she was asking me, who are the people doing what you're doing? And I couldn't answer. And so that was what we used that meeting for. But the main part of that whole story is the alienation piece. When she kind of grabbed me and pulled me back in and said, you don't just get to be bitter. <laughs> you actually have to be productive. Yeah. Um, that, and, and once I did that, there were people all over that community who were feeling similarly, like they didn't understand the words, they didn't understand the roles, they didn't understand the process, whatever, but they were sitting there like this. And what she caught was that I said something, so that gave a way to begin. Um, so there is alienation in this room from all, all uh, different ways at this. Some of you are from Play Lab, some of you are playwrights, some of you are from major institutions that are always the boogeyman, some of you are from mid-sized institutions, some of you are straight, you know, came through this academically, some of you came up through practice without that benefit of that background. Uh, th so it's, that's why you're here, it's composed that way on purpose. We, we wanted people here to sit in your alienation together and be productive. Not bitter. Um, and, and so we're going to pull at that. And that's why you're delegates. You're not, uh, you are not the anointed. And it's hard to keep that in mind as it goes on all week. We are not somehow especially charged people who can solve this. We are delegates of the people who think about this. And uh, it's just the beginning of trying to move it into the 21st century. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just say, you know, a couple more things to, just to add to that, which is more, me on the no, no, that's good. <laughs> no, hang on. Um, the, the, the thing I'd say is what came out of that for those of us who were alienated from that experience was we all started working together, and it's a collaboration that's, you know, now more than 10 years old of us having a conversation, uh, and, and, you know, for David and I in particular. So, that, you know, that alienation of, I think, Olga's point of you don't just get to be bitter, you have to do something, made all of us to really begin to think about what are new practices, what are other ways, and, and some of those things I think are, um, you know, David and I can talk about our own personal agendas and that, but just coming to fruition now, you know, 10 years, like understanding yeah, those the sort are of, just coming. just coming to fruition now, so it's kind of knowing, like, you know, the, so so I, we, we hope it will be the kind of thing that where the alienation is about um, something productive, not about a few months later saying, oh, that was the worst experience of my life, but, you know, I mean, you might do that, but I hope not. <laughs> the, a couple of things, other additional things I, I want to say about that in terms of just the style of this and what I hope you'll feel free about. We, we've been all reading among, amongst us in, in, um, uh, in, at the Institute the, um, that uh, great little piece by Jonah Lair called Group Think. Did a lot of you read it in The New Yorker? Uh, it's, a, it's a great piece about brainstorming and about the sort of limits of brainstorming. Uh, and so, you know, and I just want to reference it here because I think it might help us. The, so the idea of brainstorming, historically, traditionally, the idea of brainstorming is uh, there are no bad ideas. Uh, everybody should put out their uh, ideas on the table and you can never have enough ideas and you should just riff on as many ideas as possible and the, the safety of no bad ideas means you can say anything and, um, and we've kind of uh, built up a culture around um, the importance of brainstorming as like the key to sort of innovation and ideas. And uh, what Jonah says in this article is that, you know, there's good things that come from brainstorming, but that's kind of a flawed idea. Uh, and, and he wants to sort of take it a step further. And I, I was really compelled by this. He says, um, and, and so they do a bunch of experiments about the power of dissent within the sort of context of brainstorming and idea forming. And he says, uh, in a way, the power of dissent is the power of surprise. After hearing someone shout out an errant answer, we work to understand it, which causes us to reassess our initial assumptions and try out new perspectives. Uh, authentic dissent can be difficult but it's always invigorating. It wakes us right up. 
Um, and so what I was thinking about was um, both the importance, I think, in this convening to feel like there can be room for that, uh, that this isn't about just brainstorming. Uh, there's room for dissent. Uh, there's room for friction. Um, and that friction will break, wake us right up. And that uh, I have no doubt, because I know so many of you, that that can be done in the utter uh, respectful way that um, we know how to do it, because we've been giving feedback to sensitive um, uh, playwrights for a long time. Uh, and so I know we can do it. Um, and uh, uh, people, you know, we're all sensitive. So, um, and, then, uh, and then I think the other thing that he says in that piece, which I love, is uh, he talks about the whole Broadway formula for like what a good collaboration looks like. For, you should read it if you haven't. Uh, that a good collaboration, he has a thing called a Q quotient. But, um, and the idea of the Q quotient is that if, um, if you put a five people in a room to make a new Broadway musical who have never met each other, you'll, it'll be a disaster. It, and nobody trusts anybody else. People will kind of tear each other apart. If you put a group of five collaborators in a room to make a Broadway musical who all know each other and have always worked together before, you may not have a very great product because nobody will challenge anybody and nothing new will come into it. And so when they look to do this Q quotient, what's a successful Broadway musical, the way they assess it is, the right mix of old and new. So there has to be some amount of familiarity in the room, there has to be some amount of trust in the room, a sort of knowledge of each other beforehand, and then, you know, the best example is um, you've got, you know, West Side Story, and you bring in one new voice like Stephen Sondheim, and that changes, you know. So you don't want to keep, so if the Q quotient is one to five, you don't want to, you know, you don't want the familiarity to be five, um, but you also don't want it to be one, nobody knows anybody, or you want it somewhere in between. I think we have a kind of a great Q quotient here. Of um, we, there's a lot of familiarity, and we've worked together before in some capacities. And there's some new people in the room, and so I feel like we've kind of set ourselves up for what could be a really good collaborative uh, couple of days for the yeah. kind of you know uh, zone. And then, uh, and then this is just the kind of last uh, idea, but that um, uh, um, uh, let's see, that he, he, the final thing he talks about in there is um, uh, um, you know just getting the right composition of a group. Um, uh, he gives that great example of building 20 at MIT where Noam Chomsky worked and all these people kind of came <coughs> together. And, uh, and it was this old building that nobody wanted to be in. And so uh, they came in and everybody got to kind of create their own space and make their own room. Uh, and the amount of creativity that was generated by just putting people in proximity to each other. Um, and, uh, and so I feel like, um, and that this, I just love the lesson of building 20, which is, um, I hope, you know, kind of what we were going for here in this idea of the composition. The lesson of Building 20 is that when the composition of the group is right, enough people with different perspectives running into one another in unpredictable ways, the group dynamic will take care of itself. All these errant discussions add up. In fact, they may even be the most essential part of the creative process. Although such conversations will occasionally be unpleasant, not everyone is always in the mood for small talk or criticism. That doesn't mean that they can't be avoided. That doesn't mean that they can be avoided. The most creative spaces are those which hurl us together. It is the human friction that makes the sparks. And so I feel like um, I hope that this will be um, a building 20 uh, for all of us here. Uh, we're throwing ourselves together. Uh, we'll come into that throwing uh, with the best uh, spirit and intentions. Uh, we'll embrace um, the, the friction of it, uh, the alienation of it, uh, and, um, uh, and we'll feel as quickly as we can, because our time is short, uh, some sort of sense of safety to take the risk to, to have those kind of conversations and do that work. So, yeah. Could I do two quick little exercises around that? Because th that just occurred to me while I was listening uh, to you earlier. You are, uh, hold on, let me see if you can. <laughs> I'm next to that. Yeah. Here, you and I can cut into it. Yeah. I'm cutting into your time. 158 is where we okay, are. Okay, really fast. Could everybody stand up? Take a look around and, and actually maybe face each other. Uh, I just want to see, take a look and sit down if there's if there's nobody in this room that you are meeting today for the first time, sit down if you've met every single person in this, in this room before today. <laughs> every single person. Oh, yeah. She works here. <laughs> um, okay, sit down if, there's, uh, if there are less than five people who are new to you. <laughs> sit down. <laughs> sit down if, you, if there are less than five people who you just met here when you got here. You, and do we count Facebook on that day? Because that's no, 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 in the room. <laughs> in the room. Okay, in the room. Good, good, good. I'm just going to leave that one at that. But you see, this was on purpose. We, we always get this thing of, oh, it's the same old suspects. So just the same group of people. But you don't even know each other. So I feel better about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, stay, stand, every stand up again for a second. Can you just... Uh, Sit down if, um, if you have an advanced degree in dramaturgy or literary management. Okay. 
Great, so a balance. Excellent. All right, uh, stand up again. And uh, sit down if you have no advanced degree in theater. Okay, and now, uh, stand up one more time, last one. Uh, if, uh, stand, if, uh, sit down unless you are primarily a playwright in this conversation. Sit down if you're, if you're playwright, if you're not primarily a playwright, please sit down. How about playwrights stay standing Playwrights stay standing. Okay, you see them? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, with the people who are principally, uh, uh, people working in the context of play labs uh, stand up. So, so uh, like, I know Sundance, no. Dramatists, uh, have a seat, playwrights? Okay. And uh, sit down. Uh, and so people uh, stand who are freelancing at the moment in this work. Uh, you're, yeah, yeah, I think consider you, because you're in about in more than one. Yeah, right. Who are stringing it together. Only? Only freelancing? Yeah, from, who are stringing it together by freelancing. <laughs> That's all right, good. It may, be, it may be less precise. All right, and uh, uh, Stan, if you are making uh, your entire living, or the, the vast majority of your living, in the world of literary management or dramaturgy in an institutional context. Great. So, it's not you... I just wanted you to see, where we're starting out, it's from all over the place, and it's up. And now stand up if you're here in D.C. Ah. So these are your local hosts for the things that you need, you need to do. I know John's been in D.C. before. John Gore used to be here at Arena, so it doesn't quite count. Yeah. <laughs> Remember those early days in the field? That's right. Okay, good. So just, just to give everybody a sense of, I mean, it, part of the alienation for me in that earlier thing was, I think I'm the, I'm, I am such a freak, I'm the only person in the room who's like me. Uh, and you see that that's not, not true. Uh, and you also uh, can find that there are, you have uh, your tribe, and there are also new things to, to meet in here. So that's, that's all. So I think the Q quotient is going to be okay. Thank you.